Hi, everybody. Uh, I feel very honored and lucky to be here. Uh, when I saw Dr. Grinstrom's name come up on the speaker list, I was, I was really humbled by this opportunity. I want to thank James and Babson for bringing this all together. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> it's true. I work in the campus industry. I work in FCR Labs, the first uh, campus testing laboratory in Massachusetts, where ISO accredited, we do testing for potency, quality, safety of the cannabis medicine being used in the state. Now, originally we thought that we would open up a business and start testing for dispensaries, and that would be that, but that was a couple of years ago, and as you may know, um, the patients and, uh, haven't had a dispensary to go to yet. Hopefully that'll change in the next couple of weeks based on some of the emails I've been seeing. Uh, there should be some opening up soon. And uh, so we got we had an opportunity to work with the community a lot, for patients, caregivers, people looking for uh, resources, technical resources, trying to understand their medicine, knowing what's in it, how they can use it, that sort of thing. We also had some time to do some uh, basic research, uh, you know, vaporizers, uh, dose control, uh, different interstrain variation. Lots of interesting things, what's in resin, uh, just things that the community wants to know. Uh, so we have a pharmaceutical background, so we're bringing like real science to uh, cannabis technology. And uh, I also teach at the uh, <coughs> University of Cannabis in Natick with Dr. Moomer, and uh, who you'll probably be hearing from later, a couple other speakers. Um, it's a competency program that's training the future of people in the cannabis industry, whether they're going to be workers or entrepreneurs, or just people interested in it. And um, that's given me a lot of opportunity to talk to a lot of different people and get a sense of what they're thinking and, and how many diverse applications there are on cannabis. Uh, people come into school asking me how they can turn cannabis into a fuel, an alternative fuel, how they can use it as a medicine or a cosmetic product or a food. Lots of different questions. The vast majority of people want to do good. They want to uh, improve human health. They want to do something positive for the environment. They want to do something good for the economy. And all of them have this nature of wanting to do something good for social justice. Because, you know, a lot of people will probably agree here that some of the laws around cannabis are um, probably not in the best interest of the people. So this is a follow-up discussion that was uh, generated from a discussion that was held by the Cannabis Society of Massachusetts. My colleague, Mike Kahn, was giving a presentation, a discussion on cannabis science and technology. And the subject of, is cannabis a pharmaceutical? Is it a natural product, like a supplement? Or is it a food? How do we classify it? So we're going to take a look at um, that very thing here. Uh, just an overview, it's the diversity of cannabis and the applications, the factors that uh, influence the diversity, uh, nature and nurture, uh, examples of current medical cannabis, current classification and conflicts, the changing landscape, industry direction and examples, possible alternatives. That's where I really want to begin the discussion, so I'm going to try and leave enough time for questions and discussion. <coughs> I'm probably going to avoid Lori over here. <laughs> so, yeah. Watch out. He's getting ready now. No, 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 no. no. I like Mike Khan. You've got to work on all of our stuff. This man is good. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let's take a look and start with some of the fundamentals. Uh, here you can see this is uh, oil. It's a food. You can go to the store and you can buy it. It's, uh, it's from pressed hemp seeds. Okay, hemp comes from the cannabis plant. This guy right here. Yeah. These uh, these are the seeds that have been shelled, bagged, and interestingly enough, they're one of the most nutritious foods you can put in your mouth. They have carbohydrate, they have fat, they have protein, they have a complete protein profile. They have uh, an enviable uh, fatty acid profile. A lot of people take uh, fish oil supplements to get this. Uh, this seed has it. Um, so over here you have uh, uh, protein powder, you've got cosmetics, you've got a brick used in the building of uh, buildings, a CD case of polymer, an alternative plastic that um, is friendlier towards the environment, rope, a shoe, 
You could uh, declare your independence by uh, turning the pulp into paper, and you can use it as a fuel, and it just goes on and on. And we're not going to talk about every single application, we're just going to talk on a few of them. And as a medicine, an important medicine, and you can't really forget that when people are sick and suffering, and they have an opportunity to be healed or get benefit from something. It's, it's very inappropriate, in my estimation, to try and deny that to them. So recognizing that, you know, this the history, Dr. Hume's presentation just took you through the history of cannabis as a medicine, goes way back in the day, and it comes in different forms. This is uh, what it used to look like before we had the FDA. And here is uh, Sativex. It's a uh, whole plant extract that's been turned into a pharmaceutical. Here's Marinol. This is synthesized THC. It's a way of getting around <coughs> The uh, Schedule One. It's um, you can just take a bunch of chemicals and a beaker and a scientist and get the active ingredients. And of course, a lot of you are probably familiar with this guy. This is a bud of cannabis that uh, has been dried and cured and is typically smoked either recreationally or for uh, uh, medicine. And then it can be impregnated into foods and candies. It can be concentrated, etc. So cannabis looks very different depending on how you want to look at it. And it can be used for a lot of important things, and it does a lot of things well. It's like a companion species, just like canines. And if you look at what uh, selective reading, or nature, or genetics can do, you can take this guy as an example, and you can get a dog the size of a horse, or you can get a dog that will fit in your pocket, or whatever this is, <laughs> anything you, you, can, you can really uh, shape the, the nature of it. Like a companion species will be with us for thousands of years and will be tremendously influenced and, uh, by interaction with us. So that happens with cannabis too, another companion species that's very useful to us. Here I'm just giving some examples of plants that were bred for medicine and then we're bred specially for types of medicine. Here we have a high THC strain, it's almost 30% by weight. Here we have a high CBD strain, almost 20% by weight. And here we have a mixed strain. Notice this strain over here doesn't have any THC, this doesn't have any CBD. This has both. So if you're, if you're thinking about uh, cannabis and its diversity and its application, uh, these cannabinoids, uh, can be controlled just by treatment. And then there's the environment, or training, or uh, nurturing. So this is uh, an example of a dog that's been trained to be a soldier. He drives tanks, he does soldier stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this dog is a seeing eye dog, and these, these animals are incredible in terms of what they can do. They're able to guide the vision impaired uh, and take into account the vision impaired um, obstacles, not just their own. Highly specialized. These are rescue dogs. That's a purse. <laughs> and this dog talks to the dead. <laughs> See the future. These are all very specialized roles. They're specialized training. This purse would not make a good paint driver. <laughs> this guy would not make a good CNI dog because the, the vision impaired would be you know, charging into battle. <laughs> you don't want. And it's with that with cannabis. Uh, the, the cannabis plant that was cultivated and grown and bred to produce the fibers that were then used to make a parachute that saved President Bush's life in World War II is not suitable for a drug, whether it's for recreation or for medicine. So just because this plant has many applications, um, you can't assume that one plant would be just as good for one application as another. So this is, this is an example of the uh, nurturing or environment or training of cannabis. Over here you would see the fiber type plant, uh, intentionally grown almost on top of itself. Uh, very dense, very tall, very uh, spindly. Here we have like a mixed use where you could get potentially seeds or seeds and fiber. And over here you have what's called lollipop um, cultivation practice where you need a lot of space between plants and you have trained it to specifically produce lots of drug, whether you're going to use it recreationally or medicinally. It's going to have different nutrient needs, light needs, time to harvest, soil conditions. So these are just descriptions or depictions of what that means. 
So what are cannabinoids? Uh, these are the chemical compounds that are responsible for their activities by the human body. When you have 30% uh, of <coughs> THC cannabinoid profile, it's going to meet certain indications. It might be good for uh, reducing vomit, uh, increasing appetite, suppressing muscle spasms, all sorts of things. But they're going to be different from CBD. So uh, in terms of classifying this, I just want to make it clear that cannabis is a single species, but it can be bred and trained to do different things. And it makes it difficult for all of these different size, shape, pegs to fit into a single slot. So, uh, as has been touched on before, the plant produces this guy up here, the mother cannabinoid. Uh, enzymes then convert it into different uh, kinds based on the genetics of the plant. And then after it's harvested, um, heating is the most common way to decarboxylate and convert to the active forms. So we have some examples of cannabis being used as medicine. Uh, they've been mentioned several times now, but uh, we didn't exactly compare notes. Uh, synthetic THC, Marinol, uh, it's an FDA approved drug right now. Uh, Sativex, it's in use in 27 different countries. It's in phase three clinical here in the US. Uh, it's a plant extract, it's not synthesized. And um, all of these. And now we have uh, crude cannabis and its preparations being used in 23 states and rising. Uh, common theme, uh, a lot of the legislatures are trying to make it so that it's only available for debilitating conditions. Uh, that's not always what the actual outcome is, but that's what the intent is. Um, so how is it cl currently classified? Schedule 1 controlled substance means a drug that's in this category. It does not mean alcohol, tobacco, etc. Um, the term marijuana means all parts of the plants, so forth and so on. It really limits your ability to uh, cultivate cannabis in this country because any part of it growing or not growing um, is uh, under the Controlled Substance Act, which all of the data here can be found in um, Title 21. So is that a good classification? Well, the government says it's Schedule 1. Schedule 1 says that it has high potential for abuse, no currently accepted medical use in the treatment in the U.S., lack of safety. Uh, so that's what the you know one side of the classification uh, looks like. Over here is a different side. Uh, you have uh, U.S. Patent 6630507. Cannabinoids have been found to have antioxidant properties. Um, newfound property makes them useful in the treatment and uh, prophylaxis of wide variety of oxidation diseases. And they go on to specify some of them neurodegenerative. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, HIV, so forth and so on. Uh, the, uh, the government is the holder of this patent, the same government that says that it has no medical value. So I, I consider this kind of a, a, a conflict of someone. Does that make sense? Did I make that clear that on the one hand, it has no medical value, and on the other hand, we own the patents to its medical value? Okay, so. Here's a half trillion reasons why uh, there may be some uh, resistance to changing the schedule on this. Um, there could be a potential uh, taking of the pie of some of these groups. The pharmaceutical industry is worth 300 billion globally. So if you have a, a plant out there that isn't successfully patented, and can't be capitalized on, some of that $300 billion will be lost in that. Uh, the private prison industry, if you lose almost all of your prisoners uh, who are there for uh, minor possession charges, well, uh, some of that money is going to go away. They're not going to just house empty prison cells. Uh, the alcohol industry is concerned with having a healthier alternative, uh, as is tobacco. And the DEA. Uh, $2.5 billion um, budget that was requested from taxpayers. This does not include the budget from the 
the seizure of cash and assets from um, some of the people that they do business with. So their budget is actually much bigger. They rely on a lot of money. There's a lot of people invested in, in uh, making sure that that continues in all of these cases. So uh, there are some headwinds to making these changes. And these are just a couple that I want to touch on. In light of that, what we see is public opinion is changing. At first, I had this slide uh, titled as uh, the democratization of information. And late at night, I was thinking, did I invent that? So I Googled it. No, I didn't. Someone else wrote a paper about it. <laughs> but, uh, so I changed the title. And, um, but what it means is that we are now uh, sharing, generating, and consuming information differently than we ever have before. And what you see is during that time where you see a lot of change happening, uh, a lot of that is the internet and social media and several other factors. But you also see a definitive trend. Uh, more people are interested, and that means that the tide is turning. Uh, and the, the tide is already turning. I, I should be clear on this. A lot of what I'm trying to show you today is that we're not talking about something that's coming. We're talking about something that's here. And we're talking about something that we should probably have a more sophisticated classification system of, a more nuanced understanding of what cannabis is and uh, its different applications. So uh, the hemp industry reported hemp sales in the U.S. of $620 million in 2014. Now, uh, 2014 was the first year that they were able to plant hemp in the United States legally per states not legally for federal. It's still not. It's still federally illegal. But um, more and more states are coming on board with that. There's a considerable possibility when you look at you can make shoes out of it, you can make food out of it, you can make materials, you can make medicine. A lot of opportunity there. Our few group did some numbers. They found out that 2014, with a limited number of states with the medical programs and the uh, adult use programs, had $2.7 billion of sales last year. Uh, that's pretty big money, and uh, if they extrapolated that out to, uh, if all states were doing it, you'd get a figure of $35 billion. And I believe that would be a very conservative estimate. Overall, the cannabis industry makes that high growth. Uh, again, this is here, this is now. So when you uh, look at pharmaceutical companies, one of the most uh, interesting pages that they'll have on their website or in their literature is typically their pipeline. <clears throat> their pipeline is used by investors to gauge how healthy the company is and what the prospects look like and to kind of give people an overview of where they're at. And having a pipeline that has uh, candidates in each of the phases um, and a long list of uh, capitalizable intellectual property usually makes it a good investment. And here we have an example of GW Pharma who's doing that. They've got this huge pipeline, all of these different indications. Their specialty is in uh, cannabis-based compound therapeutics. Uh, <clears throat> another company, uh, they're looking at cosmetics, healthcare, Functional foods and nutraceuticals. Uh, again, we have Dr. Mashulam come up. He was the uh, first person to identify, isolate, and uh, categorize THC and a couple of the endocannabinoids. And if you look through their, their website, you'll find Ethan Russo. He wrote the uh, paper on the entourage effect and how the different cannabinoids and terpenoids interact with uh, your body to get different effects. The entourage effect is very important for therapeutics. It's very important for the overall qualities of cannabis and how it interacts with you. So these are things that are happening now. They're real. Uh, people, I like this also because you have those two people who are uh, well-recognized names and because of the broad spectrum of their approach to capitalizing cannabis. So I've had a lot of conversations with people about how do we categorize this? Where does it fit? And it turns out that this was the best I could come up with was to uh, regulate and oversee it based on the finished product, not on the, uh, the actual uh, species name. 
because I don't think that gives it any justice. I think if you want to um, create a pharmaceutical drug that's FDA approved and prescribed, you should go under FDA oversight. If you want a supplement, uh, approved preparation that's marketed, same thing. The FDA oversees that, but you don't have to prove efficacy and you don't have to provide safety data ahead of time. You just have to have it available in case something goes wrong. That's something that's a, a moving target right now. They're looking at changing that, but whatever the case is, if you go to a store and buy medicine, um, either from a prescription, you should have proof that it works, and if you buy it as a supplement, you should have proof that it's safe. Uh, food, I think it should just be like any other food. Uh, so you have a crop of cannabis out there, it should not be a controlled Schedule 1 product, it should just be a food. Uh, and I showed you earlier in the slides, they don't look the same. So it's not like you can confuse them. They're the same species, but they're different products. Uh, medical marijuana, um, I actually think that should stay. I think people should be able to use the, uh, the crude, uh, minimally process processed uh, plant material for their own therapeutic values as long as the, someone does some quality control on it make sure it's pretty safe. And then recreational cannabis, fruit cannabis, again, this is not highly processed and um, it is a safe alternative to other things that people recreationally use. And as such, it should be treated similar to those other things. So, um, and then industrial cannabis, uh, obviously, would just be like any other crop, it's really hot, et cetera. So I was thinking about it too. I was talking to a friend about classifying it with alcohol and tobacco and firearms, and got the fact name there and fact-based rational approach to classification and regulation. Now I don't mean this as a end-all, be-all proposal. I, I want it to be like a, something to stimulate a discussion get a lot of ideas, get people thinking, because the change is already here, and it's going to continue, and it needs to be driven to its completion, and I highly recommend that we try and get this right and, and do what's most appropriate, rather than just come up with a single classification that makes the most people happy. So, with that, I'm going to leave you with some resources that I use frequently, and open up the floor for discussion. Yes. Uh, so a couple questions, but first of all, do you do any testing in Maine now? Because they have quite a few dispensaries. I was wondering if that's something you We do. test for uh, patients and caregivers from Maine, yes. Oh, okay. Yes, we do it here in Massachusetts. Oh, you do the testing here in Massachusetts? Yes, we haven't opened a laboratory outside of Massachusetts as of yet. Okay. But we may be doing that. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate your talk very much. I had a couple other questions. Um, <coughs> Uh, first of all, the whole part about the FDA um, monitoring substances. Yes. Um, is there any possibility of that being more like the health food stores that we have now, where I believe FDA really isn't um, overseeing that, and that you know, they, they have a little statement on there that says the FDA has not evaluated? Yes, um, they they actually are responsible for oversight of supplements. Okay. However, they don't. Um, if you look at the titles and the laws, and I think you'd be able to find it if you went through this, and it's it's very difficult um, law speak. I'm not very good at it, so I didn't try and put it up here. But uh, when it comes to supplements, the FDA is responsible for oversight. Uh, however, as a supplement manufacturer, all you need to do is put that statement on it and then market it. And if something goes wrong, the FDA is going to come looking for your safety data, and they're going to be looking for other things. They're going to be looking at you very carefully. You don't want something to go wrong. And so when it comes to a pharmaceutical, they have different barriers for getting into market. They have to go through efficacy studies, extreme safety studies, and uh, just a bunch of clinical trials to uh, make sure that it works as intended and it's safe. Whereas the supplements, you just have to get up to market. And then the last, the last question is about um, the whole process of scheduling or descheduling. I'm not going to have a good idea with it, but it almost seems like marijuana ought to be like alcohol and tobacco and not any schedule at all. And is that, how does that happen? Is that initiated? Can someone just make that decision? 
politically, or is that a process that goes through the legislative? How does that happen? That is, uh, that is one of the uh, ugliest things to actually look at. Um, so the reason the reason that alcoholic tobacco um, weren't scheduled is because they were pretty much grandfathered in. And uh, there's a lot more to it than that. But if you remember the slides with the, the dollar figures next to it, uh, a lot of times, when I was in school in economics, I was I remember one professor said that every time you spend a dollar on something, it's like you're voting for it. And if you vote for things to be into existence with your dollars, if you vote for it, there are lots of them and you buy them. And if you don't, they go away. Um, well, it's interesting. Some of that money is uh, voting to get on the schedule of legislatures and, and fill them in on what those people believe is right. So uh, there are people with uh, certain beliefs and they get onto the, uh, the schedule of people who make the decisions and they have an opportunity to discuss with them what they feel is important and what the facts are. And I can't tell you exactly word for word what happened with the scheduling. I just know that um, it wasn't uh, a fact-based rational approach. Uh, interestingly enough, if you were to put cannabis with alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, it would be orders of magnitude safer than anything on that list from a health perspective. Order. As a matter of fact, when they first scheduled it, it was very close to the shape of report and said that it wasn't that dangerous. And they said, we will allow Congress to review this in two years. And they never done it because once it got in the schedule two, there's just two chickens to get it out. It, there's a lot of capital. There's outside of financial interest, there are people that are legitimately afraid of cannabis. They've spent the last eighty to hundred years listening to people tell them how bad and frightening it is. So they are uh, they have internalized that, and it's going to be difficult for them, even with people like me up here talking. Um, and providing evidence, fact-based evidence, it's going to be hard for them to change that internal. So we do have some legitimate, you know, some people who legitimately are afraid of this. And, you know, the more open discussion we have, the more scientific resources that go into it, and the more we change the overall image of what it is and the understanding of what it is, the, the more it's going to be hard for people to, to see it the way they used to see it. The harmful way. So it's important, yes. Um, you were talking about the variability of all the different strains. You get high THC, high CBD. From what I understand, it's very hard to get high CBD strains at this point outside of maybe the Charlotte Web strain that's being grown in Colorado. Have you seen through the breeding that people are starting to breed more on high CBD to get those benefits that you showed in the graph where you don't have to get all the THC, but rather the CBD, all the benefits of that? I'm glad you asked that because the middle. Um, Test report that I showed you was an actual test report. I looked at these from the labs and I cut out people's information. The middle one was an actual test report that was approximately 20% max CBD by weight with less than 0.1% THC, which is actually better than Charlotte's Web. So, yes, there, it's, it is difficult. Uh, you're, you're breeding these plants to get specific chemicals in, in as much concentration as you can, and it is challenging. Uh, Breeding plants to get that sort of specificity is difficult, but there are people that are getting good at it. So, finding that strain is difficult, or is the availability becoming like greater now in this area? It should become available. My understanding is that that caregiver <clears throat> chose to give a number of the cuttings or clones from that plant to other caregivers so that they could then um, have the CBD rich medicine, which is sometimes what people need. Sometimes people need cannabis medicine. They're looking for CBD-based medicine, not THC medicine. And just in case anybody here doesn't know, if you try to smoke a CBD-rich cannabis medicine and expect to get high, you're going to be really disappointed. <laughs> but yes, uh, my understanding is I've seen a couple of uh, couple of strains that are really CBD-rich, and uh, 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 I know that he was trying to spread those clones so that people would have availability 